have the pleasure of chairing this first virtual APL seminar. Our speaker, Professor Patsy Healy, is well known, I think, to all of you here and doesn't need really any introduction. But I just wanted to say that it is great and we are grateful to Patsy that we can actually launch our virtual seminar with Patsy and what is promising to be a thought-provoking talk on uh, power dynamics in a local community. Before I hand over to uh, my screen to Patsy, <laughs> um, I am going, uh, let me say a few words, just a bit of a reminder about our Zoom keeping issues. <laughs> Patsy will talk for about 30 minutes and after that we will have about 25 minutes or so for discussions. Um, so please, uh, I mean I can see that everybody has already muted their mics, please keep it like that until such time that you want to ask questions or make comments. Um, last point is that we are recording this session so if you do not want your intervention to be recorded, please let us know at the time when you are making the intervention. So that's all from me and over to you, Patsy, and thank you very much for taking on the challenge of this virtual talk. Well, it's very nice to speak to you all. I don't know who you are or where you are, but it's very nice to say so. Um, and I'm, I'm not, I've never done a seminar on Zoom before, so I may make some mistakes. But this kitchen table where I'm currently sitting is also a, a table around which many meetings have happened in the community. And there are two problems that happen in such situations in my house. One is the phone rings. The second is the cat turns up. I've done my best to prevent these things happening, but they could happen. And I'm sure you're used to the similar kinds of things. Now you're all working from home. Now I've just got to get to the screen share and I press screen share and I should find, there we are. I'm trying to make it to work. That's it, really. here we are. Well, I think some uh, people who are nearer my age than many of you must be um, have often said that I've often been criticised for not paying enough attention to power. So I've been trying to write a book on my experiences of the last 10 years as a, as a resident, a member of civil society, getting involved in all kinds of local development activities where we're with different groups of people all trying to share our future in this locality where I'm finding myself living. I'll come back to that in a minute. But as I'm, one of the things I'm having to do is think about the power dynamics that are going on in this locality. So I think this, my discussion is a little bit, I've been trying, is a little bit me, me going back to the analytical tools I can use to think about the power dynamics in, the, in a community. So you won't hear so much about the, the actual dynamics, which are continually fascinating, hard work, etc. But anyway, so power dynamics, and I think what the other thing that it might be helpful, where we're all living somewhere, we're all working somewhere, and we're always in small micro communities, communities of practice. And I think one of the things that's fascinated me is how these dynamics actually work when they're part of your daily living experience and your much of it is done through people that you know in face-to-face -face situations. So anyway, that's, that's just by way of introduction. And then there's a couple of other things I'd like to introduce you to, two quotations. One very recently from Sue Brownhill and Andy Inch, and they did a, uh, they've done a, a special issue of planning theory where they've all talked about the Skeffington report on public participation back to whenever it was. 17, no, 16, no, sorry, see, <laughs> don't, don't ask me to do numbers, they all go out of my head these days. Anyway, a long time ago. And what they, they talk about is par par participation situated in a field of tensions and possibilities that must be carefully navigated. 
And that spoke to me immediately because that's an awful lot what people who are activists in the community are continually aware of. The second quote, I happen to be rereading Peter Maris and Martin Ryan's really interesting book on social reform. And they were coming out of the uh, model cities movement of the late 1960s and thinking of all the interventions there. And they were looking at the diversity of these communities and what they emphasized and what others, a number of others doing similar things to me or researching community activity, whether it's in rural areas or in urban regeneration context or whatever, say like just how diverse are all these different situations that you come across. The other interesting thing is that both of these quotes are actually from the outside looking in. And they're, at, they're from people who are trying to get people to participate in, say, a planning uh, programme. People from a, a wider world trying to get people to participate. Strategies for different communities. And one of the tendencies that happens in a lot of the literature, um, whether it's policy reports or whatever, they tend to what I'm trying to use a wonderful sort of word in contemporary ge geography and sociology, singularize, singularizing the pluralities. So they say a community, but when you're in that community, is it really a singularity like that? Can you refer to it as a community? Anyway, uh, my experience has been of being involved in what I would perhaps like to call the pluralities of the micro and people's future are shaping activities there. Now, for many years now, I've tended to see social situations in terms of a multiplicity of webs of relations. And these, in my little world here, you can see multiple webs of relations. And some of these are quite small in scale, in geographical scale. Uh, some of them are extremely wide. People have connections all over the world, and some quite surprising ones. So and they're all being milled around in our little community. The other issue uh, is that we're, we're not, just as we're not a singular unit, we're not caught off from lots of other things. Among these webs of relations are many others which are trying to shape our futures, trying to shape or by the consequences of what they do, in effect, shaping our futures. And to try to get an idea of that, that shaping background, that contextual background, I'm using a concept of a governance ecosystem, which is all these different webs of relations, an open, diverse system, um, which trying to get a, a, a definition of it, an ecosystem, a set of interacting agencies with networks and nodes, which govern the collective affairs of a large social group or political community through allocating resources, regulating behaviors, and deploying knowledge and ideas. Now, you may note in those last three phrases, that's Giddens. Uh, I'm taking that from Giddens structuration, which as many people may know, I, I, I tended to use for a long time. And within this uh, governance ecosystem, there are a great many agencies, the different departments of government, the different levels of government, NGOs are very active there. And that agency world, you know, is, uh, activists in local communities are finding themselves continuously interacting with that agency world. So my interest is in the micro, the world of the everyday, the world where place, the world which actually has, a, in my particular little locality as a civil society resident, I'm surrounded with people, including myself, who have a very strong sense that we are in a place. We're not quite sure that we define it all in the same way, but we're very conscious we're in a special place. And we're also very conscious that we're very lucky to have a community. So we recognize that, and I've come to call it place community because it's continuously called up when people think, what are they doing to us? They should understand us. They should know about where we are, our place. So this very strong sense of a place of community, which is by the very recognition that we are a special place, not just miscellaneous collection of streets and fields and isolated cottages and things like that. We are somehow or other some kind of collectivity. We recognize ourselves as a place, we recognize ourselves as a community. And this sense of place and community has a very strong mobilizing power 
So it develops a capacity, almost like for people in the actor network theory, the notion of place and community has been created, but it nevertheless has created and has the power to act. And that power to mobilize lots of people's efforts to do things with, for, about the future of that place. So I'm interested in the dilemmas of this, this, micro, uh, this micro world where people are trying to shape their place futures. And I'm interested in the power that that mobilizing has. Every, every, I, from taking from a kind of structuration theory idea, I've got a really strong sense that everyone has agency, so everyone has a bit of power. But uh, the interesting question is, is how that's deployed. I'm just going to put a little um, spot on so that I can, sh I can wander about. It hasn't worked, but never mind, let's not worry. <laughs> um, uh, the, the, this diagram is a really crude one, which I've just created, try to, to, to simplify things. To, to try to express a bit more what I'm talking about, I'm interested in, the, the, in this open and fluid uh, governance ecosystem, in which there are some very powerful state actors and large NGOs, this agency world, how do activists in the micro level, how do they manage to, uh, through all this activity, uh, create a place, sustain a place, and then how far can they, they, they use those ideas to help shape the place itself? So what power do people have to shape the future of the place? And can they do it in progressive ways? Now, I'd be very interested to know if you have any better word than me to use for, for, for what I'm meaning, which is ways which seem to be filled with hope and opportunity in which lots of people can flourish, rather than one which removes hope and which only allows a certain numbers to, to, to benefit. So my definition of progressive that I've come to as an open-minded, tolerant, and outward-looking culture of local action, resisting injustice, justices, and recognizing our multiple engagements with a wider world. And in putting the wider world, the wider world is as much a non-human phenomena as a human phenomena. So I think that, that, that's where I've got to, but, that, but that, that's one of, my, I, I, one of my analytical difficulties is to find a definition. Anyway, uh, I don't know if anybody's seen this slide before, but here is this place uh, that, that uh, and uh, I mean, if, if you are an old fashioned geographer, you say, well, it looks very clearly like a, a village or a small town, very clearly contained. We have struggled with the county council to say, we do not want a settlement boundary around our settlement. And we are the only one, uh, we are, apparently we're the only one, I think, in the, the county's local plan, which does not have a settlement boundary. Um, but I think that's a, we could come back to some of the, the, the ideas that are, that are attached to the notion of a settlement boundary. But it's a small locality, would be described as a small rural remote locality, small in population, large in area. It's undergoing a socio-economic, uh, political uh, and political transition. I think Mark Shawsmith would have talked a lot about this. But uh, back in the 90, early 1990s, Philip Lowe with John Murdoch and Neil Ward and others were writing about rural areas in Britain and they referred to Northumberland as having a paternalist culture with strong landowners and an agricultural economy. And, so, and I think the transition, you could describe the transition we're going on, going on in, in very broad terms as from that society to one where tourism is much more important, where there are many more micro businesses and where there's a steady flow of incomes and many other rural parts of the country in England especially have, have had so many incomes that the, that the old rural life has perhaps become very marginal. In our case it, it's, it's, it's still a very strong part of the, of the local culture. As I said before it's a place that's clearly recognized as a place in the community and this generates attachments which give us, a, we often use the word we, you hear I'm using it, we, we hear, we, we say this, we are. So there's an interesting question, who is this we? How is it constructed? Um, it's partly we who live here. Not always, because some of the incomers don't seem to belong, other people say we born and bred. So there's a born and bred versus incomers division that crops up. Sometimes the we, 
is the locus of benefit of, of the future shaping activities. So when a group might be organizing a community Christmas day, we say it's for us, for us, we, for our community. Not everybody uh, says that. Sometimes they will say, um, we're doing this community Christmas day to help the isolated. Now there's a quite different way of construction. Once you say that, you've lost the sense well, we're all there. We, say, we might say, we know our neighbour down the road is having a bit of a hard time because they have lost their partner or whatever. So, that's a, so there's a different ways that there's in, in the little words, in the, in the kind of little tiny micro performativity, you reflect whether you think you're providing for or whether you're providing with. And people may remember a long discussion about participation for, for, for participation with from both. Um, there's also the question of the we who comment on, evaluate and legitimate the activities of the other of us who get involved in active work. So when I'm in the trust, um, when I was a chair of the trust, I was aware that there are other members of the community who would be saying, what are you doing? Why are you doing it? Should you be doing that? Now I'm, I'm not on the trust any longer. I retired as a trustee last year and I say, I wonder why the trust is doing that. They should be, are they thinking about the following? And I think that kind of a we is what is sometimes called, Andy Inch writes about it quite nicely, a public. We are as, almost like a political community that's like I've got a public in it that comments and legitimates what others do. So that comes back to my interest. All this activism, how far are we able to both become and an act for and with a place community in itself, we recognize as a place community in itself, but how far can we actually be a place community for ourselves? What, sorry, I want, I want this. That's it. there, I've got my, my stop thing. Well, the, the three areas that I've been most involved in myself have been the Glendale Gateway Trust, and I'll come back to that in a minute, uh, then the second one, that's a quite formalised agency, um, which is uh, and quite well recognised, uh, not just uh, in Northumberland, but quite uh, in the North East, but, but also more widely. I've also been involved in an email network, which has become a little bit more formalised, which is very much concerned with an email network which generated events, with spreading information and bringing together people, providing all kinds of support for older people. And that has grown into a, a, an organization which is doing all kinds of things, or it was until lockdown. And then finally, the third activity is producing a, a woolen a neighborhood plan. And I have to say, we finally got to the examiner's report, which we received this morning. <laughs> so I just noticed after that's five years ago, that's five years since, since we were declared an area. Anyway, that's a long, long story, and I hopefully won't go too much into it. So those are the three initiatives. There are actually other initiatives going on, not the only one. Um, and, but, uh, but it's these three initiatives in particular that I'll, I'll um, uh, I'm interested, I'll be talking. I'm, I'm trying to think about the activism involved with the people involved there and, uh, and, uh, and how do we look at the power dynamics of that? Well, the Glendale Gateway Trust is a, uh, is a partnership agency. It, it, it likes to refer to itself as a partnership agency and that it's supposed to be having on its board a number of people who uh, represent other agencies. It's actually shifted. Nearly all the trustees now are elected and they're members of the local community. Whereas to begin with, it had the county and all sorts of other important uh, people from the agency world. It's set up as a charity and it's very formalised in the way it works. Coordinating for Age is a very loose informal network based on email. Um, if, if people were younger, they probably would have had it social media based. <laughs> and there's a, you can see that there's a shift from using the email to using the social media as, as things go on. And it's become more formalized as many of the players there linking with some others have, have, have become this another organization called Glendale Connect, which is becoming the more formal body for a number of community events, like a Christmas day, like a, a film club, like a, um, a, an over 50s youth club, that's another activity. And then there's a neighborhood plan, which is a temporary resident group, which is formally established under Woolworth Parish Council and thereby hang many tales. But in terms of power, 
the it what's the if here down where well, i'm just pointing up here there are three levers which again comes back to my use of giddens allocative uh, with the power to distribute resource, acquire and distribute resources, authoritative, the power to deploy rules, which are not necessarily formal rules. They can also be informal rules. And uh, thirdly, framing uh, ideas. Well, I think as I was thinking of framing thoughts, I think that's possibly very near to Simine's imaginaries. So the kind of imaginaries people are deploying as they think about what our area is like and what the future is. And the trust has been deploying, uh, it's particularly focused on deploying resources. It's captured a lot of resources from all kinds of government grants and from private owners from their, and charitable funders. And it's tried to channel them to projects of community benefit, uh, according to its view of community benefit, I should say. It's very strongly committed to a, an idea of being entrepreneurial, and working in partnership. So those are continuously asserted as kind of ideas as to how you should operate. Because framing ideas are not just about what you should do, but how you should do it. And I think they very much would say that they're, they're trying to push forward the transition from how our area used to be, the old agricultural community, and, and with its kind of rather paternalist relationships, um, towards something different. Having said that, we use the paternalist relationships by saying landowners, this landowner has contributed to this project, wouldn't you like to do so too? So that we, you can lose those levers. Coordinating for age is, uh, is pulling down resources of knowledge and, um, uh, and as well as financial resources, but also trying to work by, by, by coordinating the different agencies like there are a number of agencies that provide services of all kinds. Some of them are local authorities, some of them are NGOs, some of them are small social enterprises, and trying to get people talking together about the challenges and trying to get some coordination. And as they've moved into Glenda Connect, it's almost as if they're providing through community organized services, like the Over 50s Youth Club is a fun youth club, but it's commu completely community or uh, operated. The Community Christmas Day is similar, completely from within the community. And it's driven by ideas. It's, uh, there's not much so much concern about thinking about the future, but it's driven by ideas of compassion and care. And the, if there is an idea that's mobilized frequently, it's this one of stronger together. It's a very interesting theme about strong together. I first noticed it in the community coming in from the faith groups. Will enable plan, well, you'll know much more about that. That's actually trying to to, to take over some regulatory power. Now that's uh, continually compromised by the governance ecosystem in which national government has a hierarchical view of how you should pay attention to planning policies and we're continuously being crushed by that which has been very noticeable over the last couple of a year and a half. I think. But the, uh, the framing ideas are around a living working community which is how it was and um, I think even as we're moving in the transition, the idea is, can it still be a living working community as opposed to people use sometimes the word a retirement community or as opposed to um, a, 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 a just a, 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 a commuter, a residential place, a commuter place. There's also the idea, which is one of the reasons why we don't want a settlement boundary. Because everything, every economic operation in the area is on the margin and every service is on the margin of fundability. We, we, we want to grow. We're not a kind of no, nothing here, please. We've created quite a lot of public value, but I'm not going to go into that. That's another, that's another chapter in the book. <laughs> so I can't, I think that would take us too far. But the, all, within these three initiatives, trying to work around these three levers of power Activists are struggling to navigate in a field of tension, making choices about positioning themselves in these multiple webs of relations of, of all kinds, working out how to act. Um, should, should we sometimes protest? Should we accommodate? Should we try to manipulate and shape? Should we act independently? So activists are making choices about how to, what kind of power they have and how to exercise it. And all the time, they're thinking about, well, what difference can we make? 
Now it's in that context that I've picked up um, Brownhill and Inch's idea about fields of tension and tried to think of it through multiple, I tried matrices and things that didn't work. In the end, I've got to the idea that there are a number of lines of tension through which we think about how to, how to mobilize and exercise uh, the power that we may have and how to relate to the power that others are using, the others around us are using. So I've got these five powers. First of all, it's, re it's really important to think about how we use this word power. Some people think about power as a kind of uh, a, a subject, a person, a sort of a, 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 somebody, a, a sort of node which has subjectivity. The government has the power. Some people think of power as a thing, as an object, uh, as something that can be, if you get it, you can use it. I don't, I'm not very happy with either, either of those because it stops us looking at how, how the, what, what is created and what is, uh, how people manage to get hold of, of things. So I think for me, power is a force, an energy, which can be exercised in many ways and struggle for, struggles for power about getting access to and exercising that force. And there's a lot of force in the power of agency but it then gets attached back, works through these levers, resources, rules, and, uh, and uh, ideas, allocative power, authoritative power, uh, uh, imaginative framing power. So first of all, the power to order is very familiar. We know, we feel, I'm sure many do, the power of, a, we think of it in terms of a power of a central state and a power of the law to tell us what we're supposed to do and to, to, to monitor, to limit how we do it. But the power of social norms is also important. Uh, we've been talking about COVID-19 and people saying, I'm not doing this because the government's telling me to, I'm doing it because it's, we, we need to, because what our neighbors are going to think. Now there's the social norm. As something, if something becomes embedded in the social norm, and I think a lot of what goes on, COVID-19 reveals this quite quickly, um, but th the social norms are also very important. Um, Foucault would say, well, it's a kind of disciplining power that pervades bourgeois society or something like that. But I think we shouldn't forget that and we shouldn't forget that they're also quite significant for people's quality of life at the same time, that there are certain norms by which people should follow. But then, sometimes, what do you challenge? Now, three episodes, I, I won't go into detail, but I think the one which was most um, generated, most trauma in our society was when a uh, our little place community was when a, a sheltered housing unit was closed by the, the four housing group, which was a housing association. Lots of reasons for that, but it was kind of sudden. It should have been expected because there were plenty of signs of it, but people hadn't noticed that it would happen. It happened quite suddenly and people were absolutely shocked because they felt the community, it was felt like a shock to the community. Now at the time for the trust, how to react, how should the trust react to that? The trust felt very shocked, but two members of the trust, two trustees were on the board of the, um, of the, the housing group, having previously, how they got to be there, it, it was had, previously it had been the local authorities housing that had been taken over. So there was a kind of, do we, uh, do, do we uh, a protest? Do we try to get them to operate the way we want? Um, or do we try to work together with them? And the trust's commitment to partnership actually fell apart over that. And I don't think uh, many people in the trust have never forgiven, both the, both there's two or three employees and some of the trustees have never forgiven for housing group for closing it in such a, in a way that was seen as brutal. And we have never then been able to recover our relationships with them. So that was a choice. Um, sometimes uh, when the local authority uh, decided to, wanted to, to close the bus, the one bus, we have two bus, buses a week which go to Newcastle direct and they wanted to cut one of them and, or it was almost, and there was a meeting and there was a huge protest meeting. Well, that's quite common, people are used to that. I don't know quite how much it achieved, we didn't lose the bus, um, but, it was, uh, but, but certainly those kind of things happen. The other kind of protest that we joined, and Mark Shooksmith will remember this because he 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 uh, he was central to the the, the arguments against it. Um, it was when the Conservative government, which came in in 2015, said that all housing association properties could be open to the right to buy, 
by this time the trust had, had was formerly a housing association and it had um had, and we had properties which then could be open to the right to buy thanks to a lot of uh, lobbying so we joined the lobbying uh, led among others by mark shooksmith uh, to say don't do this and eventually uh, small community groups were um, and, uh, and rural areas were taken out of that right to buy second kind of power is uh, market power which uh, in our case is the, the, the representatives of market power are particularly landowners and property owners um, some of these are private but they're not all and uh, uh, for housing group for example is a substantial owner of social housing in our area uh, but, and uh, the county council owns quite a bit as well and what they do with their property becomes significant because if they for example when the the, the school a school was moved from the near the center of, of our community down to somewhere else it immediately changed the patterns of flows along the high street and as the co-op at that time also moved to some other location it has actually changed uh, change the way one of the key sort of social pieces of the public realm of our community operates. So we are subject to these, um, this market power, but at the same time uh, that we can do a bit by shaping markets, by investing in the high, high street. The, 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 uh, the trust has done a lot of work shaping high street, the high street. We're trying to put quite a lot in our plan to encourage growth to maintain the high street. In shaping a, 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 any kind of plan, it has a market shaping ro role. And to some extent also replacing markets by encouraging social, uh, so, so community-led housing uh, in some of the uh, neglected properties and that sort of thing. And also the Parish Council has just taken over a field which is being now dedicated to all kinds of community uses. So there's, there's, there's possibilities there to challenge market power. So you're moving along this, this line of tension. Then there's power in thought, how people think about things. And I think that's or power in thought and power in habits. Now we kind of know there's a lot of literature on disciplining power, um, on power and rhetoric. And but I would say uh, that although we're quite aware that when people come and want to, uh, people from the agency world of the governance e e ecosystem, come to ask us, oh, can you help, would you like to be involved in this program? Would you like to be involved in that program? And this is how it works. And including with the neighborhood plan, they are actually not just uh, that they are offering us to be involved, but at the same time, they're kind of trying to say that the bargain is, and you've got to behave in ways that we <coughs> expect you to behave. And there's a paper, I think by um, Karina Listerborn in, in Planning Theory, I think it was, or maybe planning theory and practice, but she talked about how these agencies try to groom part communities to behave in appropriate ways. And I think that's a really interesting way to think about it. But at the same time, we can move, uh, we, you can move, you can challenge some of that. But I guess if you thought, what is the dominant power in thought of people in our community when faced with these things? It's a mixture of, of cynicism and tacit compliance, i.e. Yes, okay, that's you lot talking like that, but we don't think like that, but we'll go along with it. But having said that, there's a lot of mobilizing of attention to say, you're failing, looking at these wider forces saying, uh, please, you need to pay attention to welfare issues which are particularly relevant to our geography. We're concerned also people's, young people's experiences, older people's experiences, the isolated. When we have a geography like ours, being isolated in a small farm up, up a very, very long, windy road is a really difficult life. Uh, if, if, particularly if you're getting older and suddenly you have a lockdown, what on earth are you supposed to do? So, uh, but, but there are many other, other, other issues that are faced for that. Um, the, so, there's a kind of bringing forward people who are neglected. A lot of thing, a lot of this, the emphasis on things work differently here. Do not put your solution, your generalized way of looking at things onto us because we're different so there is a danger there's a positive attitude in the different pay attention to the uniqueness of place communities but there's a negative if you then turn and say we're different you've got to look at it we're a special kind of us and I think that that can lead to quite a nap that leads to a narrowing perspective rather than an opening perspective then there's what I, 
the power, a relational power, the power that goes on between people. And I think you could almost see that the, that with the case about the sheltered housing unit and how that opened up a huge trench between us and, and the, housing of, the housing association. And you could, sometimes it's a phenomenon that I've seen, not just in, in my community, but I've seen it in say my university life. You can see, hang on, hang on, we're getting to a vortex here and a trench is opening up. I don't know if trenches and vortex are good metaphors to use, they don't quite mix, but, but you could see it becomes a bigger and bigger trench over which it's difficult then to build any kind of relationship. And that happened before housing group, but also in the middle of this decade, that trench opened up very violent, very seriously between the trust and the parish council. As there are many dimensions to it, partly personality, but also to do with born and bred locals versus incomers, which many of the rest of us really didn't want to happen because we could see that would be very destructive. So that came to the, the, the sort of the other end of that kind of, of, of line of tension that's kind of swinging it around or pivoting it around is building bridges. And the neighborhood plan work has been like a continuous treading on eggshells as we've had to keep the relationships, particularly between the neighborhood plan steering group and the parish council, just about working. And it happens, and whereas uh, the, the, um, the email group, uh, coordinating for age, that group was uh, particularly interested in bridge building between care workers in the formal sector and the, and the volunteers. So that can be quite positive. And finally, there's the, the, my third line of attention, I must watch the time. My third line of, or final line of attention is acceptance. Um, the power, where, the power to do and to, so, beg your pardon, the dimension is the power to do and to make. Some people just say, well, we're not going to do anything. We'll let the world go on around us and we won't try to do anything. But it's astonishing just how many people get involved in doing all kinds of things. And that's back to the power of agency. For some people, um, they just like, uh, they, they like getting involved and doing things. But, but, uh, they, but for some people, they, they will say, well, we're supposed to have got, we, we, hang on, we're not going to be bothered with getting permits for this. Why should we bother with the, getting the county to agree where we put up these stands for our flower plots? Let's just go and do it. So you can see how an informal economy or activity would soon break out if people felt they were too frustrated. And I have to say now and again, I think, think that myself. Well, why do we have to wait for all these various permits where people are so vigorously trying to act? Well, uh, I, I, if I conceive of these lines of tensions as sort of go, pivoting around on kind of our place community and people positioning themselves on it, and the first three, one could very much relate to the ideas about power to, power over. You know, there's this, this distinction between power over and power to. Command and control, exercising market power, suppressing awareness, a power to, which, uh, which, which power over, which tends to, to generate people's protest against and trying to do things differently. But a lot of the rest is about power to act. And it's very evident just how vigorous that power can be in a locality like ours. So just a quick summary. Interestingly, putting it all together, I would say that with exercising all this power locally, we've generated a kind of proto-political presence. But interestingly, there's not one known to which you could say, this is the place community, it's by lots of different ones. So it's a kind of plurality of nodes creating this presence. Mobilizing around caring for place community, doing a lot of future shaping work and recognized externally by the county council, um, by the homes and community agency, by uh, the national park, by various other, other various agencies as, an, uh, as a, a vigorous actor in the system, uh, in the govern wider governance ecosystem. But we're not very co cohesive as a political community. I could come back to thinking about what is a political community if people wanted to. Uh, with a plurality of active nodes and uh, lots of ideas about the future, not always in agreement. And that's, I think, where, the, 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 where, where some of the struggles uh, between different sorts of ideas sort of play out. Not too clearly, people aren't quite aware of them, but they are, they are underlying some of what people think about. So to conclude, for discussion, I, I, I'm thinking about it, well, 
I just really wanted to talk about this idea because I've never used this lines of tension idea before and I wondered how it worked. How does it work for activists? I think it might be quite helpful to think about you know, what do I do here? Which is the line of tension I've got to be really working on here? And for analysts trying to work out what's going on to get underneath the, the uniqueness, the, the complexity of communities. Would we, and then the question which is often asked, would we be more cohesive if we work together? Lots of people say, we should be, we should all get together. Why is all this division between us? And others say, well, some of the literature says, it's quite good to have lots of different arguments going on. Um, are we just, and this keeps coming up, and I've heard it in seminars in Newcastle as well, are we just creatures of neoliberal hegemony? Or is there more autonomy here, and more autonomy to do things differently? Um, I think I, I, we could have a discussion about that, but I, I, I think, and I, I'm agreeing with um, Paul Cloak and colleagues down in the West Country, where they looked in, where they looked in quite a lot of, of, of examples of this kind of thing, and they would come to the conclusion that there's much more autonomy here than one might think. Um, are we actually helping the transition to go on? Um, is, there, is, is, it a, is it a transition we want? Not everybody wants that transition from the old community. Some people want to go back to it. Are we helping it to get along? Um, are we impeding it? Is there more we could do? And are we, how much of the time are we actually tr going, going along progressive line? Or there are other ways? Could, could we, we turn inward? Could we become NIMBYs? Romantic re retreat, romantic rural retreat? And, and are we making any kind of contribution to the wider, to the wider transformation of things which perhaps we're, many of us have been looking for for a long time in our wider society? So those are the kinds of discussion, of issues for discussion, which come up when we th start thinking about the power of local dynamics. So I think with that, I'd better uh, stop screen share. Is that correct? Yes. Stop share. Thank you, Patsy. Thank you very much. I wonder, we, we, we are muted, so we cannot clap. But uh, can I just, on behalf of everybody, thank you for a, for a wonderful and for keeping more or less the time. Um, we have about 15 minutes for discussions, questions, comments, everything. Um, and people have used their thumb up, which is a good way to show their appreciation of, the, of your talk. Um, and can I just say that now I can see a full sort of list of everybody who's participating and it's great to see so many people uh, being involved in our virtual seminar. It's really great to see everybody. Um, just, just to say that we're going to go into the discussion and there is an icon somewhere which I think it says reactions. You can use that icon to raise your digital hand, which is a blue hand, or just, uh, you know, at the same time, you can raise your hand and I'll try to spot where the hands are and then we can get on with the discussion. So without further ado, any questions, any comments for Patsy, please. Remember to unmute yourself when you are going to ask the question. So... I can't see any hand raised yet. Maybe I should just kick the, kick the discussion. <laughs> One of the jobs of the chair is that if there is silence, you have to say something. So um, I'm going to say something. Uh, Patsy, um, there, there, is, there is something which I'd like you to elaborate a little bit more. I mean, you did talk so eloquently about the, how do we use these levers of power? And I quite like that. Foucault uses technologies of power. You use levers of power um, in order to do things and, 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 and to, 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 to bring about change. But I think one of the things that maybe it was kind of in the background was the ability to mobilize these levers of power needs power itself. So when we talk about the Wool, uh, Wooler community, we need to appreciate that there is a bigger ability within that community and with the members of that community to mobilize these levers of power. And that is asymmetric in our societies. 
Uh, yes, I, 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 I fully take your point. I think th conceptually, if I'm following in a kind of Giddens type of thinking about structural agency, agency always has power. So everybody has some. It's just the circumstances make it more or less difficult. People have different capacities to work out how to use their power. But I think the base point is agency always has power. Not some people will argue, no, that's not the case. But I, I, I would take the Gidensian position, agency always has power. So it's how that gets mobilized. Now, communities differ, and I could think in uh, hugely, um, and I can think of some communities, some rural communities, particularly uh, in areas, uh, more southern areas and, uh, than, than in the UK, uh, rural communities have been settled by people who, are, who have a lot of knowledge, expertise, net networks, people who've moved out of the cities, who've, who've had lots of resources to buy in. What's interesting about communities in Northumberland, particularly uh, on the coast, it may be different because there's been much more uh, in movement into the coast than it has been in the rural areas. In an area like Wooler, I think I remember a comment from one of the people that I know very well, who's, who's got a farming background and she was uh, a sheep farmer. She, she said, and she was born in the area, she said uh, about, about 2000, there were 60% born and bred, 40% incomes. She now says it's about 50-50 and it's moving towards the incomers. The incomers are not the most um, professionalized. I'm probably quite, I'm probably quite unusual. As is somebody else who moved in quite recently. He used to be director of planning and transport in Newham, I think. <laughs> we keep having to tell him this is much smaller. You're not expecting to arrive here at all. Um, but, but so we're quite unusual. And um, mostly there are pe people coming in uh, I suppose they, 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 I don't know quite what we would be, they're, they're cashing in their property values from places like Kent or, or they're also, my, uh, um, in order to be able to, to, to save a bit of money, uh, to get a bit, because they haven't got much in the way of a pension and they buy into something which is much cheaper here and can release pension value. They're coming up to be near grand, grandchildren and things like that, or children, their grandparents trying to be nearer their children. They're coming up from the, the Northeast because they always came here for holidays. So there's not that so much money coming in among the incomers. It's not that kind of a, a base. Uh, the, there are some people, much more affluent people, they, but they tend to be scattered in the smaller hamlets and, and, and the big houses that you can find in, 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 in the outskirts, in, in the, the distant parts. Yes. And we also have 30% of the housing in Wooler itself, I think I've got the figure right, is social housing. So there's been another group of people, sometimes it's not so easy to let, partly because the, the, the story about letting and social need in our area is a social housing need. Is a really complicated one but sometimes the housing the the poor housing group can't let its properties which are quite old actually mm. and then people in emergency from other parts of the region come into the property so there'll be some people who, who there are one or two people who are really probably extremely isolated so if you like we're almost like a microcosm of the mixture of people that make up a society as a whole mm. we've got um, just down the road We've got the head of Persimmon Homes, lives and acts as a, a, a paternalist landowner. We've got, and, and then we've got uh, people who are, who come here because there's nowhere else to come that, that, to, to, to find themselves some housing. So I think that makes it quite interesting. And there are divisions uh, among us. So, and, and that's, I was talking before about how, the, the kind of pretend, the, the benevolent, the benevolent charity some of the are we providing are we being benevolent charity benevolent or are we just providing fun things for our friends and i think several of us keep coming back saying never lose the fun things for our friends and go around befriending and that's been very important and very interesting and thanks to our wonderful parish council has has finally moved to build the bridges so it's repaired the bridges in order to create something over these last couple of months to support the people in all sorts of situations. Thank you, Patsy. Any other questions? I can't see any hands, but please do just unmute yourself and just ask questions or comments, Mark. 
I see thanks, a hand raised. <laughs> thanks, Simon, and thanks, Patsy, for a fascinating and very thought-provoking uh, seminar. Uh, lots of new ideas there, as long uh, as, as well as lots which uh, you've influenced me with in the past. <laughs> so, thank you. Um, I'm very interested in in some of the new ideas that you're bringing in, like the lines of tension. Um, <clears throat> and there's too many questions to ask, but let, let me just take a a couple of very specific ones to, to start the discussion going, maybe. Um, what, what is around framing and around power as discursive power, um, at, which interests me particularly, as you know, with more of a Borgervian than a Gidensian approach, uh, the symbolic violence and so on, uh, or, or Luke's mm -hmm. with uh, the third face of power. You, you mentioned framing and you, you talked about power in various ways. Um, and I'm curious to know how your thinking handles the idea of discursive power, um, both in terms of discursive power at the macro level, where let's say mm -hmm. a national government is framing everything in terms of austerity mm -hmm. or uh, environmental groups may be framing things in terms of you mustn't have any development in the countryside, mm -hmm. uh, th th those sorts of things. What's the micro activist response to that? Mm -hmm. But also, how does that relate to what framing there might be at the local level? Mm -hmm. Because I know that you know your group in Wooler is very independent minded and will be critical and make up their own minds on on some of these things uh, and, and that I suppose brings me to the, the the second related thought that I I had which is um, actually I'm, I'm, in, I'm immediately thinking of third and fourth ones as well but I'll just, to... <laughs> can I, can I just pause can I just pause you there Mark because we've only we've got about four minutes okay. left of our time Sorry, I'll stop. Uh, if I yeah. could possibly if I could ask Patsy to, to, to come back later, because I can see one hand being raised, I'd like to pick up that question, and then I will go back to Patsy to mm. respond to these two questions. And I think by then we will be running out of our time. And can I ask people to be brief in asking questions? Thank you. I think the hand that is raised is uh, Liz Brooks. Yeah, hi. Um, hi, Patsy. Um, thanks so much. That was a really, really interesting talk. Um, with Mark, we've been doing some work on um, leader in Northumberland, so lots of these questions have come up. And one of the theories from our wider EU project was about autonomy and powers of immunity and powers of initiation. Mm -hmm. And um, that was Clark in 1984, mm -hmm. um, writing about um, autonomy and what it is. And um, I suppose in your lines of tension, I saw the powers of initiation, the power to act, but I didn't see the power of immunity, which is um, about the ability to resist interference from higher government levels. Mm -hmm. So I just want to ask if you think that should be included and whether it's relevant. Um. First of all, with, with Mark about discursive power, I, I, I th I'm very conscious of it. It, it, it operates, uh, it, it, both the macro and the micro operate in the kind of flow of conversation. You might be in, say, a meeting of the trust and people say, well, there's the government talking about the big society, or we know the government is going to come and chop this and cut this. <coughs> You are, me oh no, it's okay now, you, for a moment you were muted. Right, okay. <coughs> I'm unmuted, I'm, I'm unmuted by host, thank you. Sorry, I, I think the macro and the micro dimensions of discursive power are very evident in our, in, in discussions. People are, there's people are very aware <coughs> of the austerity program. They're very annoyed about it. They see it as the cuts and they see that as a damaging public services, and they see, which for some people looking backwards say, they're damaging the world that we thought we built years ago. And people are harking back to the working class struggles which generated uh, the mid 20th century welfare state. And very often the welfare state uh, would, be, would be recalled. 
um, particularly I, one, some person who was a, a, a religious person and he was very good at wonderful uh, sermons and we sometimes get a sermon reminding ourselves of beverage. So there's that kind of uh, continuously challenging the rhetoric of austerity as seen to be damaging to our community and trying to counteract it. <coughs> and, but then at the same time, the micro is struggling among itself to articulate itself. It's very interesting that, uh, and, and looking, I was looking at, 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 at Mark, at your work with David Brown, and you have these different frames that come through in rural areas. And there's a huge missing one, which is about environmental quality, environmental sustainability. Now, individuals have a strong sense of it, but we haven't worked out there isn't something which actually promotes an environmental agenda and how do we react to have an alternative climate change a kind of program. People aren't sure what to do, and I think we've discussed it, but, um, but people aren't sure how to make it as a local program. Now, I, I think probably you know that we're trying to work out what that could be, but there isn't much um, local leverage as yet. So in order to exercise, to mobilize a bit more discursive power behind that frame, we would have to, I think, generate more momentum behind it ourselves to localize it because it hasn't got local leverage. I'm very interested in what Liz said about, about this work by Clark, which I don't know at all. I'm certainly interested in these concepts of, of uh, uh, autonomy. I hadn't thought of immunity, but I think I had thought of resistance because I think all the time we're saying, should we resist <coughs> or should we not? And it happened, it's happened just over the last few weeks, two or three weeks actually, where we're trying to resist some of the, the what the county wants us to do in our neighborhood plan and what apparently the national planning pro guidelines seem to say. It's all about what they say and what they interpret. And we would like to have certain phrases, uh, for example, we, we don't like, we, we, the discussions about the meaning of uh, uh, building houses in the open countryside, the meaning of outlying settlements. Can you have more than a single dwelling in an outlying settlement? You know, on these precise definitions, and they're trying to thrust down on us something which we never had imagined because we'd thought something different. So sometimes we, we try to say we have to resist, but they're in the context of the neighborhood plan, in the end, we are ground down by it. Because if we want to get our neighborhood plan through, if we wanted to challenge any of this, we'd have to wait another, I don't know how long it would take us to do these challenging over minor details. And these crop up towards the end of a process by which time everybody's exhausted. So that grinding down process, uh, which is embedded, I'm afraid, in the neighborhood plan process is, a, is, is not a, is an example where uh, it's that we try to resist and we take an ethical position that we should try, but in the end we give in because we say, well, it's more important that the plan gets approved. So I think there's a lot of that, uh, there's, a, there's a lot of that discussion do we have to give in or can we uh, can we uh, carry on autonomously and because we're mostly following the rule of law and mostly following a kind of cultural norm this is what normal people should do this is just really really interesting maybe that's more Bourdieu and Mark I'm not sure but the cultural norm which of course Mr Cummings has just broken the cultural norm is really important uh, in, in saying Yes, that's how we should operate. Maybe we shouldn't operate like that. And we're pushing it, but not too far. Okay, I think we've reached the end of our time. Uh, thank you very much, Patsy, um, for a um, wonderful uh, seminar. Thank you, everybody, for participating um, and asking questions or just listening and enjoying the talk. Um, there is no need for us to finish here if people want to carry on talking to Patsy, but those of us who have other things to do, this is the time to say goodbye and we can end the, end the meeting. But I'm not going to end the actual Zoom meeting in case if, you know, some of you want to stay on and continue the discussion. I was just... Yes, Patsy. I was just going to say one thing, maybe it's too late because people have gone, but um, apart from Mark, if anybody would like to read this chapter, it's still in draft and I've, I've already got lots of things I want to change about it, 
but I'd be very interested in feedback, even though you can't really tell the whole um, process because uh, uh, you, you can't tell the whole context because that's all the, all the details elsewhere in the book. But I'm not going to send it to Mark because he's going to have to read the whole book. <laughs> If you're interested, send Patsy an email. Yes, that's a good idea. Hmm. I can see quite a few volunteers now, Patsy. So they will be in touch with you. Yes, uh, yes. Um, can, can you I give them my, 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 well, no, I'll remember to look on my Newcastle email. Hmm. Jen, are you going to ask a question or are you just volunteering yourself? Well, probably a bit of both. <laughs> But um, I, I don't know if it's necessarily a question, but it was just more um, following on from the bit of the discussion that uh, was had prior to people sort of leaving. I just found it quite interesting that, especially when you use the example of neighbourhood planning, um, because obviously when, I'm, when you were talking about this, obviously that's kind of where I'm thinking with my work in neighbourhood planning. Um, and yeah, I just think that there is this kind of the resistance side and the grinding down of neighbourhood planning and it's a long process and um, you get to the point where you think actually it's more important. At a community level, it's more important to um, get the, the, the plan approved. But I was almost thinking about the lines of tension being at two levels as well. So you've got the lines of tension at that community level where you're constantly negotiating them on a, on a daily basis for five years or, or however long it takes but then there is that higher level of the tension of neighborhood planning in and of itself being probably quite an inappropriate process mm -hmm. and resisting that at, at that level as well but i don't necessarily think that's maybe at the place level it might be it might not be but i just thought that was quite interesting and i don't necessarily think that's um a question but it was just more to say that i found that quite interesting for my work so but can I make just a quick comment? I, I thought that I, I thought it could possibly be used in other contexts as well as kind of playing through. And as I'm doing this, as I was thinking about this talk, I sort of forgot to say that actually, especially given our our role as planning educators and as professionals, that we're actually actors in the governance system most of the time or analysing the governance system. And many of these things apply to the communities of practice that you can see developing around that. So <coughs> there's another uh, one day, but, but I'm getting rather old and I think I might not have the energy. One day I'm, I've, I've said to the, the planners in the county council, I might do a paper on neighbourhood planning in Northumberland. But, I, but I, at the moment, I just think yeah, I want wow. to get rid of it. <laughs> I'm not surprised. It takes a lot. It, it just takes a lot to yeah. do them. Uh, Gavin so, yeah. Parker uh, was telling me, uh, I've been, been in touch with him recently, uh, and he was telling me that he's been doing work for national government. And he's yeah. actually said, you know, there's a, a decreasing take up of neighbourhood plans as people contact, people thinking about doing them, contact other groups who've done them and they say don't. Yeah, I was talking to Gavin uh, recently as well, and he yeah. was telling me a bit about that work. Yeah. And yeah, it, it is quite interesting. It's quite interesting for me as I'm writing up my thesis and my final great, chapter is great. partly saying, let's redesign neighbourhood planning because it's yeah. not appropriate. So Absolutely. that's quite, it's quite a good way for this to be going, I suppose. So yeah. Well, we had a government this morning. Was it this morning? Oh, the housing, the minister was saying, Jenrick, was saying, let's leave it all to local authorities. They really know what's going on. I thought, oh, now maybe, maybe this will permeate <laughs> to a higher level. <laughs> hmm. uh, yeah. Hi, Patsy. Thanks a lot for the talk. I'm Georgiana, who asked you for the books. Hello. <laughs> uh, hello. Um, yeah, like Mark said, there's a million questions. One that comes to mind is that well, I've never been to, to the community you presented. It looks very nice. But I think the point you made about the fact that it's borderless it's or limitless or it doesn't have a boundary mm -hmm. is quite good. So when I worked in Glasgow, for example, I struggled quite a lot with the council because the Glasgow city centre did not have an official boundary, right? So oh, then really? it's quite... <laughs> Yes, there was, uh, I don't know if you know it, there's the motor... No, 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 uh, but, but we have a neighborhood plan story just the same was in circle, But now the M8 is basically half of a circle, so there, and, and then they told me in the end that they did not want to actually have a city center boundary because then the relation with the 
businesses which place themselves outside and so on. Mm -hmm. So my question, I guess it's related to this idea of proto-political communities and when people uh, organize themselves, how would it play on a city level? Because, you know, if you had like, well, there is the governed community and the party community and imagine they will all be quite strong, then how do you have a city vision? And maybe then we shouldn't have city vision or city plan documents mm -hmm. because then they will always, using the point of Mars discursive power, shape the whole discourse to leave many of these tensions aside. So I guess my point is more about from a mm. governmentality point of view. For smaller communities which are in rural settings, it's, it's really great to have these tensions, I think. I think even for my work on the campus, us as a campus community, we can work on these tension lines. But mm -hmm. once you go in the realm of governing a city or a territory, to mm -hmm. use Eldon's new book, um, yeah, how, how would you see these conflicting uh, narratives and communities in the end cooperate towards the goals of a bigger area, you know, um, a city or a region or Newcastle or Northeast? Mm. Because in a way your yeah. points make regional and city plan, you know, why should we have this overarching, do I mean, they're useful in a way, but they will always limit all these kind of powers, right? Yeah, I, I think it's. I think it is a very interesting and it's also a very important question. But but I, I'll put the issue of borders to one side. I think that we're all struggling to work out how do we actually manage to 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 prevent us setting it, setting borders, which then limit the kind of flows in which we know we're engaged. So I think that that's an issue that's a really quite a tough one. But but this issue about multiple visions and, and multiple political communities. I mean, I've got a. I, I've, I've, I've had to think about how can you tell a political community and my proto-political community is partly because only some of those things are kind of present. Um, but if we think of a city government, and it's very interesting I, uh, that, that say e macroeconomists who are writing about the future of the world, they, they say we must get back to community and you think, what do they mean? They actually mean city governments, which is really quite an interesting, <laughs> interesting conclusion that they've come to. But, but we judge our, we often, as we look up to, as we're all, we as individuals are parts of many different political communities. So we might have, we might have a neighborhood political community, but when I was in Jesmond, I never had a sense of a neighborhood political community. I had a bit of a sense of a city government political community. I had a sense of being part of an academic community and a planning community and all of them had their, their, their power dynamics. Um, but there wasn't much in the way of a neighborhood. Now, I think perhaps if I'd been in Manchester, I might have been more aware in the 90s and the, uh, the 2000s that the quite a strong building up of neighborhood communities as significant coming together, which could then articulate their views and maybe then uh, uh, create a voice, which was something that the city level uh, could somehow or other listen to. So it's a question of uh, if there is no, nothing, no voices kind of popping up, then, then at a city level, you're perhaps the, the people who happen to be part of that political community de facto because they pay their taxes to it in one way or the other and they get their services from it. They may judge that political, that, that, that city administration as to how far it's capable of reaching down to the many members of that community. And if the many members of that community feel that its city vision is wandering off into some abstract world, which most of these visions are, <coughs> um, the, the, then and even the having of a vision is something that people say, oh no, it's that lot, they're doing that kind of thing. So to give it meaning, it means an awful lot of work in strategic framing. And when I was thinking about this at the strategic level back in the 2000s, I thought, and, until the strategy, until the framing idea has entered people's heads, is that Bourdieu in Mark, until it's a part of the, the inhabited world of people's, people's lives, that strategic vision has no meaning for those people. So many of these visions that we see articulated in the planning literature, etc., have no meaning. Now, it'll be very interesting with our neighborhood plan has a vision, and interestingly, we arrived at it, and then one of us drafted it, and nobody subsequently has ever wanted to change it. They say, okay, that's it. 
but whether I think it'd be interesting to see what happens if somebody uses it again and says, do we still think that? Does that really express us? It'd be interesting to see. I don't know. I don't know if anything in our neighbourhood plan has entered into anybody's heads. No, that's not quite true. That's not quite true. <laughs> we're, we're more concerned, has it entered into the parish council's heads? Hmm. I don't think I've answered all your questions, Georgiana. <laughs> well, we can have a discussion one day. One day we'll be allowed to meet. Yes. <laughs> it's been very good, thanks. Yeah. Thank you very much, Patsy. I think we can now officially close this and then <coughs> we can invite Patsy to a Zoom meeting and continue this discussion. Unfortunately, we can't say you can continue the discussion in the coffee room or anything. No, like that's that. a shame. Yes, yeah, so I'm just looking for Thank you yes. again, Patsy, for, yeah. for, for generously giving us your time and. Uh, well, good luck with the book and the chapter and everything. Well, thank you for giving me the time because because you need it. I need it yeah, to have some possibility of interaction. So, and it was great seeing everybody. Okay, bye bye.